used to have people ask us questions like, could you take a picture of Adam and Eve? And the answer, you know, this is 40 years ago, the answer then, you could take a picture, you couldn't get it developed anywhere. Seminex was the result of an accusation that 45 of 50 faculty members were teaching heresy. You guys are throwing your lives down the toilet. Uh, that, uh, you know, you've spent all this time, you're not going to get a call in the, in the Missouri Synod. We were loyal sons and daughters of this Missouri Synod. It, it was not an impact, it was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, it totally redefined my vocation, totally redefined my view of the Holy Catholic Church and changed my life forever. And I can remember going out of the house and saying to my wife, if I vote to stand with the students, we're going to lose everything. Is that okay? And she said, do what you have to do. I got fired by the acting president for not being willing to accept his leadership and go back into the classroom. I wouldn't wish this experience on anyone else and I would not have missed it. I don't think um, that I could ever forgive Jacob Price. God forgive me for saying that. On February 19, 1974, students and faculty at the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's St. Louis Concordia Theological Seminary marched through the campus quadrangle, out the doors of an institution, church body, and well-established educational system, and into self-described exile. It's a story that has roots that begin in the 19th century when a debate arose over biblical interpretation. Known as the historical critical method, it had torn apart many Protestant churches by the early 20th century. Were Adam and Eve real people? Was Jonah actually swallowed by a fish? Or did ancient authors reflect their own historical situation when addressing the people of their time and place? For Missouri Synod Lutherans, the full impact of these theological debates and culturally conservative versus more modern worldviews came to a head decades after other church bodies had divided and drifted apart. The debate ruptured the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod at a time of vast American cultural and social upheaval, Vietnam, the Civil Rights Movement, and Watergate. For many students, faculty, administrators, and Lutherans throughout North America. The events in St. Louis took a personal toll. The walkout would divide families, split congregations, and have a lasting impact on the future of the church. Following a series of divisions and mergers among ethnic European immigrant Lutherans in the 19th century, American Lutheranism had emerged in the middle decades of the 20th century as separate, growing Protestant Lutheran church bodies. Viewed from the outside, these leading American Lutheran church bodies appeared to have few differences. Each tended to reflect a mostly white, middle-class membership. Each tended to practice liturgical forms of worship, a focus on word and sacrament, infant baptism, and a strong commitment to hymnody. But within these Lutheran churches, particularly among its clergy and its seminaries, the theological differences became distinct. There's a lot happening in American Lutheranism in the 1950s and 60s. Much of it is related to what's happening uh, more broadly in America. Uh, the country is uh, suburbanizing. And so in American Lutheranism, you've got uh, white flight uh, to the suburbs, powered by a GI Bill and uh, the baby boom. And a lot of those folks are uh, going to Lutheran churches. It fits in with the kind of conformist model of the 1950s. America's inner city churches are, are transforming, and so Lutherans are moving to the suburbs, but the church is exploding in size too. There were a lot of factors in play in the 1940s that are kind of under the surface. There was a, a growing conflict in the Synod about church relationships. 
Should the Missouri Synod be engaged in talks about fellowship with other Lutheran churches, for example? And it was something that really grew uh, as the decades went on. The Synod did try to deal with the conflict all the way back in the 1940s, but it really wasn't able to come to terms with the real theological questions involved. And I think one of the results was the events that took place then in the 60s and 70s. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and its distinctive history began with a group of German Lutherans from Saxony who immigrated to Perry County, Missouri. Led by Martin Stephan, a charismatic Lutheran pastor from Dresden, the group of 750 souls pooled their money and in 1839 bought passage on five ships bound for New Orleans. While crossing the Atlantic, one of the ships, the Amelie, went down, drowning all aboard. The surviving pilgrims arrived in New Orleans, boarded steamships, and made their way up the Mississippi to St. Louis in search of a new home. Rather than settle on the prairie, Saxon scouts staked out land 100 miles to the south of St. Louis in Perry County, Missouri. After establishing a settlement near the Mississippi, sickness, hunger, and a series of misconduct accusations leveled at Stefan resulted in the ouster of Stefan and the emergence of a new leader, C.F.W. Walther. Walther and other leaders built homes, churches, schools, and even a seminary. In 1847, Walther's group organized themselves along with other German Lutherans in Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan, forming what would eventually become the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod triples in size between you know, the World War I era and by the time you get to 1970. The church is moving away from its German heritage model. As things grow and change so much, uh, combined with the fact that you've got so much social change taking place in the early 1960s, conservatives react. My name is Herman Otten. I'm the pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven since 1958, and I'm the editor of Christian News. Well, I first came into touch with it when I came to the seminary in 1952. I came with the assumption that they were going to jam Peeper and Walter down my throat. When I took the bus from New York City, my father said, you think for yourself, remember everything should be based on the Bible. Don't let them shove that down your throat. Well, I got to the seminary and found precisely the opposite was the case. They were rejecting what the Bible said. The newcomers coming in, the new professors. See, they went to Europe, some of them had gone to Europe and they imbibed, say, Boltman, uh, Barth, Stuff, uh, Negrin, Alain, and now they came to this country and they were going to enlighten us. There were certainly the seeds of something that lived out of a great tradition um, and also saw um, ways of moving this tradition into new possibilities. And so already when I was a student, we had people like Yaroslav Pelikan, Richard Kebner, who were wanting to move forward in new and exciting ways. The real central problem that is uh, facing us today is how does the church arrive at the proper interpretation of the Bible. There are a number of things in the Bible that uh, are not just quite so easy. And so there is a process of biblical interpretation, we say. What does a given passage of the Bible mean? Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. It is finished, John 1930, he has risen. Stay faithful to the word. Don't get influenced by the majority. Not following, you know, what politics say, but only what scripture says. Herman Otten is the one who helps define what it means to be a conservative in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. His paper, Christian News, uh, it's first called Lutheran News, but Christian News is filled with stories that are both theological and political. And so you'll find a story in here on some theological issue that's purely theological, and then you'll find another story on Martin Luther King and how Martin Luther King is a communist. What he does in the 60s is very illustrative of what's happening elsewhere. To be a conservative means to be anti-communist, uh, opposed to the civil rights movement, 
uh, here on social issues and right on down the line. If, if you feel threatened, if, if, if it seems like we're losing our, our doctrine, for example, if it seems like we're losing our hold on our understanding of the Holy Scriptures, or our understanding of the Gospel, if we're afraid that we're going to lose that, then we want to hold on closely to what we've got and retain that. Uh, if we're interested more in forging relationships with others or simply being Christians in the world and living with one another in peace and harmony and fulfilling the goal of concord, of mission in this world, then we might be more concerned about being together as Christians, as living out that Christian faith and life. Both of those concerns are very important. And I think that you see that the different concerns growing in the Synod in the 1960s and 70s are, are really valid concerns. But the way that those conflicts are resolved, I think, are part of the nature of this conflict. Key individuals and groups in the Seminex story included Jacob A. O. Price, president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod from 1969 to 1981, a strong politically and theologically conservative faction within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, John H. Teachin, president of the Concordia Seminary from 1969 to 1974, the Concordia Seminary faculty, and most of the student body. Jack Price was the president of the Synod, uh, elected in, in July of 1969. Formerly, he had been the president of Concordia Theological Seminary in Springfield. But he had been a, a pastor, a professor, a se seminary administrator, and president. And now he was in the position of being Synod president. He came in with uh, certain ideas about what the Synod needed to do, the direction it ought to go. And I think everyone realized at the time that he was elected that there probably would be some conflict as a result of this. The basic issue has to do with the doctrine of Holy Scripture. It uh, surfaced with the matter of inerrancy. Can we, on the one hand, believe that the Bible is the verbally inspired Word of God, and on the other hand, say that it contains errors? There has been one school of thought who says, yes, you can reconcile uh, an inspired Word of a God who does not lie with an erring scripture, and the other party says you cannot. The basic reason that that issue came up at this time was the uh, intrusion of the use of the historical critical method of biblical studies uh, into the uh, teaching at Concordia Seminary. I think the word uh, an erring Bible should be expunged from our vocabulary, and I think rather than spend our time looking for errors, we should spend our time studying the Bible, submitting to it, as Luther says, taking our reason captive, poking out the eyes of our reason, and accept it even though we cannot always understand it. And I think this has been the, the, probably the basic problem, has been the attitude toward the Scripture. This business of saying we must treat it like any human document and subject it to the same uh, rigorous uh, examination that we apply to any other ancient document, I think, I think is simply wrong. The Bible is a unique book, unlike any other book in the world. I think we should revere it as such. Jack Price was elected to the presidency of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in 1969. That same year, John H. Teachin was elected as president of the Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. John H. Teachin was a very energetic person, and a very pastoral person, and a good theologian. But he wasn't the kind of theologian that sat in his study and wrote books and wrote articles. He was the kind of person that knew theology very well, Lutheran theology and beyond that as well, and uh, put it to work pastorally. Well, Price and Teachin were major, you know, super personal figures. Uh, and uh, I'm sure all of that was in with and under the mix. Disputed clauses, the ones that were laid out, were supposed to be having to do with interpretation of the Bible. Uh, that was a major factor, but it was really only part of an overall picture in which there were really two different mindsets within the Missouri Synod. One which was uh, mission-minded and uh, ecumenical-minded and was looking outward toward the world, and the other one which was more insular and protectionist and really to protect the church from the uh, intrusions of the world uh, into it. Was the historical critical method the main issue? I, I look at that now and I say no. Um, it was one of the issues 
that uh, certain people in the life of the church feared was somehow contradicting their understanding of faith. In other words, the historical critical method uh, was not deduced down, they're taking my, our Bible away. There was a fear factor involved in terms of what people believed and that activated their fear. This ha was happening very close to Vatican II um, and, and, and the awakening of, 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 of uh, uh, ecumenism, the liturgical renewal, so, uh, so there, there was a, a much more of a reaching out in, in, in a dialogical kind of a framework that, uh, or p passions that were there. But th that also, to some degree, tended to curb uh, really strong kind of denominational identities, right? Some of the, the blurring of the boundaries. And that was good in my opinion. I think that was terrific because we keep confessing that we're w one church, one holy Catholic apostolic church. But I think that also... Um, you, you know, we weren't rabbit bear fans, you know, we became sort of fans of football, right? And there's a difference between those two. There's, a, there's less of a passion about it. I think one of the basic questions that, that people were trying to come to terms with at that time is what does it mean to be Lutheran in America? This is a question that goes all the way back to the founding of Lutheranism in this country. How do I hold to the Lutheran confessions? What is our doctrine as Lutherans? What is our practice as Lutherans? And I think you see by the 1940s that there are, people are beginning to answer that question, what does it mean to be a Lutheran in America? They're answering that in different ways that will lead, again, to conflict in the years to come. I think that for most of the uh, people in this conservative movement, they would suggest that their motives were pure, that all they wanted to do was to preserve traditional Missouri Synod doctrine. The country around them is falling apart. You've got uh, Roe versus Wade and abortion. You've got you know Vietnam happening. You've got the civil rights movement has turned in, into something much you know uglier and, and desegregation battles in, in uh, America's cities. It's a it's a time of great social turmoil, and in the churches they're seeing turmoil as well. But they really saw themselves. I think many of them did see themselves as protecting you know the Bible. Here's this. This, this fixed thing that is under assault and we're here to protect it. That doesn't mean that they didn't use whatever means necessary to get it done. To a degree, we were children of the 60s, I think. So you had some major transitions going on uh, in the United States. And I think in reaction to that, people were looking for something that didn't change, that they could hold in their hand and look at and agree with everybody that that's the way it is and that's the way it's always going to be. And I think it was against that background mm -hmm. that uh, some of the things at Seminex happened. I really don't think uh, that any of us thought, including the faculty people that were there still, that uh, it would happen so quickly uh, and it would happen so radically. The Board of Control made its decision to suspend me after agents of the president of the synod were unsuccessful in efforts to arrange a deal which would have made suspension unnecessary. Well, the story of Concordia Seminary in exile really begins with events that took place in St. Louis at Concordia Seminary, where I was the president. In December 1970, a fact-finding committee began interviewing Concordia Seminary faculty members. The tape recordings of the interviews were transcribed and excerpts were eventually published and distributed in a document known as the Blue Book. We had a major investigation of the faculty as part of the effort of the president of the synod to bring people into line with what was presumed to be the correct doctrinal position. The meetings were conducted down the old synodical office building in downtown St. Louis and they were about one hour in length. And uh, there was a, a, a group of uh, pastors and professors and synod vice presidents and so forth that met with each, in, each individual professor and interviewed them, had a series of questions uh, that they were asked. And everything was tape recorded and transcripts were made. And so it was an effort to try to come to terms with some pretty basic questions about where they stood on Lutheran theology and practice, how they understood the Lutheran confessions and what their views on scripture and the gospel and those kinds of things were. It was a, an interview with a committee, the so-called fact-finding committee that Jack Preuss had appointed. 
and one or two were sort of my friends. One of them fell asleep during my interview. I was asked, uh, did I believe Adam was a human being just like us? And I said, no, because uh, when Adam fell into sin, according to the Bible, it affected the whole of subsequent humanity. I said, when I fall into sin, it only aggravates my wife. I think I got grilled on what was supposedly my main uh, 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 what diversion from Missouri Synod, that Schrader's for the ordination of women, and we know that's contrary to the Bible. We used to have people ask us questions like, could you take a picture of Adam and Eve? And the answer, you know, this is 40 years ago, the answer then, you could take a picture, you couldn't get it developed anywhere. On December 13, 1973, Arthur Carl Peepcorn, the graduate professor of systematic theology at Concordia, collapsed and died in a barber shop near the seminary. Uh, it's impossible to describe Arthur Carl Peepcorn. He was such a distinguished and great person. He was surely one of these lights. He was uh, such an outstanding scholar. Um, and he was such a human being. You know, he wasn't old, he wasn't sick. Uh, but then before long we'd say, you know, well, he died of a broken heart. Uh, and when we had his funeral, which was of course a super event and which prevented Tejan from getting sacked one month earlier, because that was, would have happened if Arthur Carl's funeral hadn't been, I think, that same weekend that the Board of Control met. But one of our dear friends and Arthur Carl's students who flew in said, Ed, we're not just burying Arthur Carl, we're burying the Missouri Synod. If I had to point to any one point where I uh, came on board, was going to his funeral and thinking, this is hardball, what's going on here, and I'm not going to back down an inch. In January of 1974, the Board of Control of Concordia Seminary met and voted to suspend President Tejan from his office as president. Immediately after that, the word traveled quickly across the campus, and the faculty and the students began to organize themselves. To declare a moratorium on all classes until such time as the Seminary Board of Control officially and publicly declares which members of the faculty, if any, are to be considered as false teachers, and what scriptural and confessional principles, if any, have been violated. Two, to spend our class hours until the Seminary Board of Control informs us of its decisions, communicating to the Board of Control and to the Synod at large what we have been taught at this seminary, especially the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The students uh, formed a uh, committee to uh, speak to, uh, you know, from the students' perspective, what was happening. And the student uh, coordinating committee met uh, at various times. And finally, in 1974, uh, February of 74, the students uh, decided that uh, since, the, since John Tejan was suspended and since the faculty then said, uh, we will not continue to teach, the students said that they would go on a moratorium. They would not go to class. Uh, the faculty was given an ultimatum, either honor your contract or uh, be fired, and they said that they would uh, not go back to teaching. The response on the part of the faculty and the students was, was a significant one. They, they disagreed with the, with the suspension and they disapproved of it. And as a result of that, the students voted to uh, go into a moratorium. They stopped going to classes. Uh, and also the faculty voted to honor the students' moratorium. If the students weren't going to be going to classes, they would not be teaching classes. If their president was suspended, they would also regard themselves as suspended. And so they didn't teach their classes. So there's a, you notice there's a great deal of, of loyalty uh, among the faculty and the students and President Tejan. Uh, it's commendable loyalty. They all stuck together. In my estimation, they were good, faithful uh, teachers of the church uh, who were being either wrongly portrayed or wrongly understood, um, even as I was trying to figure out my own uh, Lutheran, um, what it meant to be a Christian in the Lutheran tradition. You know, the professors, I, I mean, their scholarship, their character, I mean, who they, who they were, 
and um, I mean what they um, what they ultimately gave up um, uh, was uh, I mean made a great statement to, to me as a as a student. The minority professors, there were five press professors that were not part of the faculty majority, they continued to conduct their classes and the students who wished could continue to go to those classes. But for the most part, regular life here at the seminary shut down. It was during that time also that the students began to travel around the country to explain to congregations and people out in the synod what, how they were being taught how they understood the conflict and what they thought was at stake in all of this. Uh, we had 259 fellows around the country and they covered 118,350 miles to tell the, the members of our church body what we have been taught and that our, our uh, professors have not been given a fair hearing. This uh, moratorium dragged on for weeks. Finally, by February of 1974, the Board of Control uh, exhorted the faculty majority to return to teaching its classes and warned them that if they did not come back to class by a certain date that they would be held in violation of their contracts in a sense they would be vacating their contracts as professors at Concordia Seminary. The program of instruction which I am asking you to resume in the name of the board is the one that was agreed on when you registered. The only way this objective can be met is for all of us to go back to work. If this should not happen, and I've underlined these words in my text, if this should not happen, then the burden for disruption will lie squarely on the shoulders of those who do not return to the classroom. We are in Pritzloff Hall here at Concordia Seminary. And it was in this room in February of 1974 that the faculty met for a discussion about whether or not they were going to go into exile. And it was in this room that they chose to do that. They, they took a vote, voted to go ahead, sang a hymn, and then proceeded to go out down to the field house where they met the students for a gathering to talk about what to do next. My name is Marie Hoyer Schrader. George Hoyer, my brother, was on the faculty as, as homiletics professor. My brother-in-law was Martin Charleman, who took over as acting president after John Teachin was suspended. My father was retired. He had been a professor of church history at Concordia Seminary. I was privileged to be among the people in the field house when the students decided to go into exile, so I marched out with them. We came across into the quadrangle, and white crosses had been handed out to everyone who wanted one. They wrote their name on it. My husband wrote Schrader on it proudly. And these crosses, as we came through the quadrangle, would stop and put them into the ground in rows, I think. As we marched by, there I saw the name Hoyer. It was my brother's cross, of course, but to me it meant my whole family, all our history connected with this seminary, all my all these, these preachers in my family had gone to this seminary and its former incarnation downtown. And so I cried. We each um, carried a, a cross and um, that uh, some of the students had made out of uh, cheap wood and painted it. And I wrote on it my name and my brother's name. He was uh, on internship that year. but but uh, it happened to be his birthday that the walkout occurred. And then we walked out under the Luther Bell Tower. A couple of the students closed the gate or the, the archway there with some large panels which said, uh, in exile. Walter Brigham, the famous Old Testament uh, professor who was at uh, Eden Seminary at the time, uh, spoke to us uh, some very inspiring words and uh, told us how important it was uh, the, to not just be in support of order but also in support of what was right. And then we walked down following a processional cross down the uh, driveway to the seminary and out to, um, to the street. So that was kind of a symbolic action but meant to say that uh, we were together, we were in this together and that uh, the cross was going before us 
and uh, we didn't know where where this was all headed, but uh, we were we were ready to take some risks because we felt that the the cause was right. Together, we share a common faith. Together, we put our trust in God, and we let Him lead us where He will. We know we can count on Him. Amen. Amen. Concordia Seminary in Exile, or Seminex, began classes the next day. Neighboring institutions, the United Church of Christ's Eden Theological Seminary and a Jesuit seminary at St. Louis University provided initial classroom space. The Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago provided accreditation for the faculty. John Teachin was elected president of Seminex in February 1975, and the first graduation was held at nearby Washington University. Eventually, Seminex acquired its own rented facilities in Midtown St. Louis. No longer did I wonder whether there were students in the classroom taking notes to prove that I was a heretic or uh, sitting there to pass judgment on me. They were there to learn and I was there to help them learn and to develop in the Christian faith. Seminex was the first place that I saw women serving communion and the first place I saw women preaching and the first place that I saw women ordaining, being ordained. Being the spouse of a 7X graduate was something that uh, has impacted my life and my faith in uh, incredible ways. When the decision was made to go into exile, that was a decision that we made as a couple, knowing full well that our life and uh, what, what we were, perhaps not knowing full well what we were laying on the line, but knowing that we were putting the future, our future, together uh, in the kind of ministry we had envisioned seeing ourselves doing together, we were putting that on the line by the decisions that we made. A lot was put on the line uh, for a lot of people. I had a call, that call was taken back, and so instead of going to a very comfortable congregation, I was left without a call. <laughs> we received uh, words of support except for one and that was at that time uh, the pastor at my home congregation and he called up and said um, he said you don't have a choice to make and I said what do you mean by that he said um, if you go to uh, Concordia Seminary in exile then uh, you will not receive any um, uh, grant aid from our district and uh, I just politely said to him thank you for helping me make my decision. The ladies guild took away my scholarship for books and the pastor sent me a letter saying I could attend worship and he would allow me to take communion but I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. I had an opportunity for a placement for ministry. It was in Chickasha, Oklahoma. But the president of the Oklahoma district was not going to ordain me. And uh, it was one of the vice presidents of uh, the Oklahoma district, uh, Waldemar Bud Frank, um, who said he would come and ordain me. I've got the ordination certificate with um, all their signatures. Following the upheaval at Concordia Seminary and the formation of Seminex, a new organization was formed, Evangelical Lutherans in Mission, or ELIM. In 1975, presidents of eight districts of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod were threatened with removal from office for allowing congregations to ordain Seminex graduates as pastors. After the formation of Seminex, you have these kids, they finished their last year at Seminex, they're being graduated and they're being placed in Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregations. Uh, Jack Price doesn't like that and he wants to stop the process. Um, there are eight district presidents, uh, the Dirty Eight, uh, as they become called later on, who um, continue placing Seminex graduates. And eventually four of them are, uh, he's given the authority by convention to fire. I suppose I should pause here and point out that J.A.O. Preuss was my grandfather and I, I knew him very well. 
My grandpa told me one time that the most difficult day that he had ever had as president of Synod during this period was in the spring of 1976. This was not a process that he enjoyed. It was something that the Synod back in, in summer of 1975 had decided that those district presidents that continued to place Seminex candidates uh, were operating or would be operating in violation of the Synod's constitution. And back at that convention, the Synod authorized him to remove those candidates or those uh, district presidents who were placing candidates. Well, the day came in 1976, in the spring, when, when he fired those four district presidents. And I remember my, my aunt and uncle telling me, they were at my grandparents' apartment that day, and he came home from his office, which was just across the street, and he slumped down in a chair and began to weep. And he kept saying, I've destroyed the Senate. I've destroyed the Senate. Fallout from the Seminex controversy was widespread. Individuals within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod educational system and its mission board lost their jobs. Entire congregations divided, some voting to leave the Missouri Synod, and thousands of individual family members felt the need to choose sides. By the 1970s, you increasingly have Lutherans that are self-selecting into churches that are more in line with their, not just theological, but also political beliefs. You look at surveys that were taken in the early 1970s, and uh, you know, roughly half of Missouri Synod Lutherans were Democrat, half were Republican. Uh, you know, most of them thought uh, uh, when they were asked, you know, would you like to see all Lutherans come together in one denomination? They said yes. Uh, they, they didn't fit anywhere on that sort of cultural, political, you know, conservative versus liberal scale. Uh, they might have been more theologically conservative in some areas, less so in others. Um, but take surveys 20 years later, and what you'll find is that you know, 85, 90 percent of Missouri Synod Republic, uh, uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans define themselves as. Republican, I'm conservative on this, 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 right on down the line. They're lockstep. Uh, there's a real kind of a monolithic set of attitudes. You find that not quite as much in the ELCA, but what you do find in the ELCA is among the clergy, uh, much more homogeneity. And so 85% of them will self-identify as politically liberal. Years later, after we moved to Chicago, uh, there were three of us all from the same congregation that went into the ministry and had not seen one of these three since 1966 when I had business over at the Lutheran Hospital and I walked in and he was sitting there, he was doing something with the chaplaincy and we were just overjoyed to uh, see each other. He said, how does it feel to have followed a loser? And I, at first I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, what do you mean? And he said, teach him. And I said, do you see where I live here? Do you see I've got a job where I travel around the world? My ministry is with our companion churches around the world. I've got a beautiful family. You call that losing? In his mind, it was because I had deserted the church. Uh, and we, it was talking like that. It was, it was total, I'll call it alienation or what, but I mean, we couldn't talk. In 1976, a new church body, the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, AELC, was formed. By the early 1980s, a strong call for merger between the AELC, the Lutheran Church in America, and the American Lutheran Church signaled the end of Seminex, which dispersed its faculty and students to seminaries in Chicago, Dubuque, Iowa, and Berkeley, California. In 1983, intentionally Seminex dissolved and uh, I for example along with nine colleagues and two retired faculty came here to the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. I uh, went to Seminex in St. Louis in 82 and 83. I was part of the very last class. It meant that everything was a last, you know, the last year, the last Christmas at Seminex, the last classes, the last time Doc Kemmerer taught. He, um, was probably in the 70s, I believe, when he was teaching his last preaching class in that intermester in June of 83. Uh, in fact, um, the very, very last day 
It's my other claim to fame. My very last day uh, at Seminex, uh, John uh, Teach was the presider. I was the assisting minister, and Paul Mons played the organ. That was the very last Seminex worship service in St. Louis. Exile initially, or to most people, sounds like an Old Testament word. Israel schlepped off into Babylon or Assyria, and eventually they came back. Maybe Old Testament exile was finally to get back to the homeland, and it was. But the New Testament notion of exile is to get up to a homeland where you haven't been yet. And for many of us, that became then the major image of what exile was, not someday to go back. And then when Seminex finally dispersed a decade later, and the ELCA was coming over the horizon, some of us said, ELCA is not the homeland either, folks. <laughs> The whole thing was for the sake of the gospel. And uh, we were uh, led out, went out, picked out, whatever, um, for the sake of the gospel. Um, and um, I believe that. I, and I think that uh, what kept us together and what led us to go and what kept us together after we went uh, was the centrality of the gospel. In those circumstances, one learns, I think, as a Christian, uh, what truly matters. And when the crutches are removed, um, one learns to rely more deeply on the grace of God. And that came through so strongly for us. After Seminex had happened, I became unafraid to look at any Bible passage from a new perspective. We were always overlooking, you know, watching what was happening behind us and saying, how do we say something that's acceptable here? And, and uh, you know, the old civil rights slogan, the only thing that we did wrong was stay in the wilderness too long. I, I simultaneously had this sense, something huge is happening and I'm part of a community who who will experience this together and who will walk with each other through this together. Looking back now on, on the 40 years that have intervened, I was too naive probably even to be fearful. It, in some ways it was terrifying, but it was so liberating at the same time to, to, to be knocked out of that trench that I was walking in and say, oh, this is about the rest of my life and where I will, I will spend this one precious life that I have. So I look back on it now with nothing but joy, relief, gratitude, um, and, and um, the fears, any that there were, became really more than anything a laboratory for learning to trust.